Um, what I wanted to talk about today uh, really links into um, both uh, my latest book, Engineering a Financial Bloodbath, which is not going back to my own journalistic days as a bit of journalistic license. So this comes as from a quotation from Mike Smith, who is the Chief Executive Officer of ANZ Bank, who when asked to uh, uh, explain the, the bank's relatively poor performance, said to the analysts in question in Sydney, well, if you think this is bad, go to London, go to New York, and see for yourself a financial services bloodbath. And of course, this was not something which happened by accident. This was a, a result of uh, a series of strategies, a, ser a series of failures, both within individual banks, within the regulatory system, within the political system. And so it wasn't a perfect storm, although that's the usual excuse that one hears. It, one is reminded of similar excuses which were used in Wall Street in 2001, 2002, associated with Enron, WorldCom, Adelphi, Tyco. And I spent more time than I care to remember sitting in courtrooms from New York to Houston, basically listening to people saying, oh, well, it was a perfect storm. And of course, when the uh, uh, global financial crisis really hit and you had a whole series of hearings in Washington and in New York, and I go dutifully get on a plane from Sydney, and I go uh, over to New York and over to London, and I say here the same thing. So it was a perfect storm. It wasn't our fault. Nobody could have seen it. Although there was one interesting uh, uh, dimension from which I'll come on to, which was Alan Greenspan's admission in uh, hearings in Congress that he found a flaw in his ideological worldview. And that was a very important admission. And so that links into the subtitle of the book, which is how subprime securitization destroyed the legitimacy of financial capitalism, because what is actually being delegitimized is an actual a precise mode of capitalism. We have moved away from managerial capitalism capitalism into financial capitalism, and we haven't actually updated our regulatory structures to take into account the fact that we have moved into a different mode of, of capitalism. So this is not basically a Marxist analysis, it's just simply a statement of facts. So this links, I want to talk in part about to, to that book, and I also want to talk in part uh, to a project that I'm doing in conjunction with a colleague. Uh, Professor Melvin Dubnik from the University of New Hampshire on retrieving the meaning of accountability in financial market regulation. And so I want to link both things together because both actually speak to the really substantive <coughs> question, which I think we are really in danger of losing sight of as the, the, the worst manifestations of the GFC basically recede and we're people talking about the green shoots of recovery. And it seems to me that we haven't actually dealt with the fundamental question, which is what is the purpose of financial regulation? And unless we deal with that normative dimension, we're not actually going to get anywhere. So, What I really want to talk about in the short time that we have available is what can we learn about accountability? Uh, because we seem to have moved away from government to governance, from governance to responsibility, from responsibility to integrity, uh, to accountability, without really understanding what do these things actually mean in practice? Um, what is the actual use of accountability within particular frameworks. So that's what, I'm not sure why this isn't working. Ah, okay. So there are three main criteria that we're looking at here. First is, well, why has effective reform of capital markets proved so elusive? You know, one goes back to the failure of long-term capital management, one goes there and goes in, to, uh, which in itself was linked into the Russian default, which then leads into the Asian financial crisis, which goes into dot-com, which goes into Enron, which goes into the global financial crisis. So why are these crises happening so often? Uh, why has all of the reform failed, irrespective of whether or not you use a rules-based approach, as in the United States, or a principles-based approach, uh, as in the UK, or in Ireland, a combination of both or the application of neither, depending on how cynical one wants to be. Um, so what we really want to do is like, map the parameters of what constitutes the parameters of accountability. And that's a very, very complex task. 
And in large measure, this is linked to the creative ambiguity of the concept itself. And of course, in Ireland, we're very well aware of the power of creative ambiguity. In fact, this was the cornerstone of how the Northern Ireland peace process operated. So when one thinks of Mo Molan talking about uh, it was all right for, uh, uh, or it was a politically acceptable for the IRA to engage in some kneecapping or killing because it was a bit of domestic housekeeping, then you see basically the, the problems associated with creative ambiguity. But it does highlight a possible disconnect between the rhetoric and the substance of reform. And I think this is a really, really critical thing because one, if one looks back to Enron and, and the aftermath of Enron and we had the passage of Sarbanes Oxley and one remembers the big debates about how Sarbanes Oxley was so invasive uh, and you have section, the infamous section 404 on internal controls, you know, that this was going to be really, really difficult. Uh, uh, it was going to be very costly for the firms, but it was sold to us as an exercise which would actually ensure that we would not have these excesses ever again. So in actual fact, Section 404 failed in the rules-based approach. But equally, one can see in the United Kingdom, which, the, which had the most, much vaunted uh, risk-based approach to regulation, uh, that it also failed. And when the, I thought it was very interesting when the Financial Services Authority gave its mea culpa for its failure uh, with Northern Rock, suggested, well, this isn't a failure of the concept of risk regulation, it was a failure to apply it. Well, it wasn't just a failure to apply it in relation to Northern Rock, it was a failure to apply it in every major institutional or financial institution in the London marketplace. And so what we're really kind of getting at here is that part of the a major part of the problem is that the failure of effective accountability really rests on a failure to focus on the normative infrastructure. That what we're really talking about all of the time is the technical aspects of regulation rather than the normative. What is the purpose of regulation? And unless we actually deal with that, we're not going to get anywhere. I speak on a regular basis to William McDonough, a former uh, head of the uh, Reserve Bank of New York, uh, first chairman of the PCAOB set up in the aftermath of Enron, uh, served on the board of Merrill Lynch. And uh, I remember throughout 2007, 2008, I'd go and see him on a regular basis and uh, say, well, you know, are we, where, where are we in this? Uh, and I remember speaking to him in October 2007, and he said, mark my words, this is a market of incendiary toxicity. A market of incendiary toxicity. This was October 2007. So this is just after BNP Paribas had talked about the vaporization of securitization markets. You had just the beginnings of the financial crisis. And there was a recognition, and this was at the time when Stan O'Neill was being forced to, to, to stand on as head of, uh, of, of Merrill Lynch. And then I go and see him in April, and I said, well, you know, well, where are we now? You know, are we, are we getting, because of policymakers who are all saying, this is all contained, it's containable, you know, there's nothing really to worry about. And he was saying, we're not even around the first corner. So he's a very good gauge of where, basically, things were. <laughs> and his argument to me then, and has been consistently, I've, I've, I've worked with him, and he's contributed to books that I've edited in the past, is that if we don't deal with the normative dimension, as to the purpose of regulation, what effectively we're doing is we are effectively rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, uh, that ultimately we're setting ourselves up for failure. So it's not necessarily that regulators necessarily lacked the tools. It's not, it's not even a question that there wasn't adequate disclosure. There was just a failure to actually apply that, either by the market which has a serious effect on efficient market, efficient market hypothesis, and through that, the regulatory tools that regulators use to regulate the market. But it also has serious implications, it seems to me, on the actual conceptual underpinning of the regulatory framework itself. And we need to really address this. Tony Delosio, who's the chairman of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, He's just been appointed the chair of the Joint Forum, which links together IOSCO, the Bail Committee on Banking Supervision, and the Council of Insurance Supervisors, which effectively will be the global risk council uh, moving forward. 
has, uh, has cautioned that we need to revisit these conceptual underpinnings. And it seems to me that the debate that we're having at the moment is still working on the efficient market hypothesis, and God bless them, the economists really do need something to hang on to. Uh, but I, I don't think it's actually sustainable, and I think if you speak to policymakers or practitioners, they will tell you exactly the same thing. So let's just set up the board in terms of what we know. Effectively, there are three interlinked phenomena on a global scale. Different seriousness, degrees of seriousness in different jurisdictions, but essentially they occur, they're, they're linked into, into three different uh, failures. So there's a failure of governance, uh, including remuneration incentives, skewed in, in, in favor of short-term profit taking. And of course, the governance mechanisms can also apply to the political system because the political class basically had short-term uh, decision-making uh, processes uh, and viewed things uh, according, to, according to those measures. You had flawed models of financing, including basically securitization. Uh, and then you had regulatory structures predicated on risk reduction, which created these incentives for arbitrage and paid insufficient attention to systemic credit risk. So people were looking at the failures of, was the risk of a failure of an individual firm, rather than basically the fact that effectively what you had was everybody using the same risk management models, uh, which were using data, which uh, effectively was too short term to basically predict what was going to happen as a result of a deterioration of a loan book. Um, and was working on basically really flawed assumptions of efficient markets. So I think if you, if you look at it, there are the three key kind of like criteria. And there are the three criteria of failure that basically any reform of financial regulation needs to take into consideration. So how do you actually deal with these questions? Now it seems to me that it's very clear that you can't really deal with them by technical considerations alone. You can't deal with them via rules because rules will be transacted around. You know, show me a rule, and I'll show you an, um, uh, uh, a corporate lawyer who's really able to transact his or her way around them. You can't rely on principles because principles lack the granularity to be enforceable. All right? So what you really need to do is you need to rely on a mixture of rules, principles, and crucially, social norms. So let's use one of the few economists who still has credibility, Oliver Williamson, winner of this year's Nobel Prize. Um, and Williamson has come up with a really quite an interesting framework in terms of how we should regulate markets, any, any market really. And it's the new institutional economics framework dates from a paper he gave in 2000. And what you have is basically four particular levels, you know, so you're talking about individual transactions at the level of a firm here down at the bottom, and that's a continuous give and take. You know, uh, financial services uh, thrives on innovation, right? The whole purpose of financial services is to get a product before any of your competitors basically design that product and utilize it. So you're always basically exploiting gaps in the rules, right, to create something. That's the whole purpose of innovation. Uh, as Joseph Stiglitz uh, said in Congress uh, a couple of months ago, you know, we built an architecture based on a privileged innovation over security, and so now we need to find some way of balancing innovation and security. Then you've got your governance uh, arrangements, which is one to ten years, and uh, given the, the propensity to move into crisis, it's probably once, once every year, two years, one thinks of the trajectory of corporate governance reform in the United Kingdom, for example, from Canberra onwards, and you've got complete changes in that the whole way up through to 2003 because of continuing failure of governance mechanisms, and that here was the way to basically move forward. And then you've got your institutional framework, which is effectively your legislative framework, which is, tends to be quite stable uh, and reviewed only on, uh, on a 10, 10 to 20 year cycle. One thinks in the United Kingdom, for example, the arduous process of getting the company law uh, basically changed. And then what he talks about here is his social norms, this non-calculative societal contract which is basically slowly creates, right? And all of the focus has been on these three levels, right? Ultimately, what 
the global financial crisis has demonstrated is how this eroded, and eroded really dramatically within particular epistemic communities. By particular epistemic communities, I'm talking about investment bankers, I'm talking about the legal community, the audit community, the regulatory community. So whether you think that this is a failure of regulatory capture, whether you regard this as a failure of NUI, that they just couldn't be bothered, ignorance, you know, it is basically a failure, right? It is regulatory failure. And it is because nobody was really paying that much attention to what was happening to the social norms within the epistemic communities that actually make up the marketplace. So interestingly, in 2006, I was doing a lot of work on private equity. This is at the time private equity was really, really you know, moving forward. Leverage was king. Uh, major corporations were being taken over. And there was an attempt in Australia to uh, take over Qantas. And this would have been, if it had been successful, the, one of the single biggest private equity acquisitions. So we came late to the party, but we were going to part it anyway if it went through. And um, so it was very interesting how the whole deal kind of like was, was put together, and I knew the lawyers involved, uh, and it was quite interesting in terms of how they structured the deal. And they structured the deal in ways which were technically in compliance with the rules, uh, but in substantive breach of the rules, but basically they were perfectly legal, right? And so he was completely thrilled with himself that he had managed to do this. And as a practicing lawyer, he did a very good job uh, for his clients. So there's, uh, of that, there was no doubt. Um, but I remember at the time I went over to, to London and I spoke to Michael Gordon, uh, who is the chief investment officer of Fidelity. And he was explaining to me that, you know, he didn't understand, you know, well, why would you basically invest in private equity and be charged 20% for the privilege in this illiquid market? It just doesn't really make any sense to me. Uh, and that he saw that fund managers were moving into this uh, on an ongoing basis. And he was saying, well, I mean, I just really don't understand it. And I said, well, you know, these are professional investors, Michael. You know, I mean, they can see that this is everybody's chasing yield. You know, surely they're not doing this because they don't understand these risks. And he said, yes, they are, unfortunately. And then he said something which I thought was really interesting. He said, Mark, again, mark my words. All of these people tend to come to me with mark my words kind of like things. But again, this is prior to the collapse. It's really important. This interview took place in February 2007 in London. And he said, mark my words. He said, greed will destroy this. And he said that he had been working in London and New York in the 1980s and the 1990s. He had been through the whole um, uh, leverage buyout uh, uh, fiascos. He had been through long-term capital management. He had been through the dot uh, uh, boom as well as the collapse. And he said that every single, single restraint in the city of London had disintegrated. Every single restraint in Wall Street had disintegrated. And so there was nothing left. There was absolutely nothing left holding this up other than the fact that basically the deal was continuing. Now, it's very interesting that a couple of months later, Chuck Prince, who was then the chief executive and chairman of Citigroup, gave an infamous, what is now an infamous interview with the Financial Times in which he said, well, you know, as long as the music's playing, you've got to dance, and we're, the music's playing and we're still dancing. And effectively what was going on was it was an enormous game past the parcel, you know, except it was booby-trapped. Uh, and so when the music stopped, whoever was left holding the parcel was going to be in serious, serious trouble. Um, and it wasn't just in, within the financial institutions, because the financial institutions were selling these products into uh, local councils and places as diverse as northern Norway or rural New South Wales. Right? They were selling it into uh, um, regional banks in China. And they, uh, they were doing a lot of this via Sydney. Uh, and I remember having a conversation with the chief legal counsel of an investment bank in Sydney, and we were talking about this, and said, well, do you think this is ethical? You know? uh, and I said, no, I don't. Uh, and he said, well, but it's not illegal. 
Well, no, it's not illegal. So no, that's okay then. <laughs> you know, and that's basically. But but it was interesting. They recognised, even though they were dealing with so-called sophisticated investors, that there was basically something quite. They weren't. It wasn't quite right. Right. So there was a recognition that this was the case. But of course, there was lots of pressure on these financial institutions to continue this kind of activity. Because basically, if they didn't, they were losing market share. If they were losing market share, then that was a capacity for their share price to go down. If their share price went down, basically that had a net impact on their bonuses and on the tenure of the chief executive. So there were incentives the whole way through this process for this to continue. So uh, it was perfectly rational in one way, for Chuck Brintz to, to continue dancing. Uh, and it becomes really quite problematic. And so it, all of these are linked to these kind of like social norms, which we thought were really quite stable and secure. And in actual fact, they were actually eroding from within. So you had the illusion of a robust system. Uh, but in actual fact, there was nothing really of substance behind it. Uh, and that is ultimately when you hear President Obama talking about the need for a new ethos of responsibility, when you hear the President of the European Commission talking about the need for ethical reform, for fundamental reform for ethical as well as economic reasons, basically it is a recognition that ultimately the global financial crisis is a failure of integrity, it's a failure of ethics, and that ultimately if we want to rebuild confidence, to re-establish confidence and trust in both financial markets and the products that financial markets provide, and those who actually act as intermediaries in that process, then basically we have to demonstrate that that trust is warranted, right? It's not enough simply to say, we recognize that mistakes were made, let's move on, right? That is just not acceptable uh, anymore. So. Let's go back to the 1940s, and I think because we're talking about we're in depression. Luckily, Australia had a technical depression for one uh, for, for 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 one quarter, and that was it. Uh, other countries have been have not been so lucky. But it's kind of interesting if you go back. There were three really pivotal, leaving aside Keynes for the moment. We're all Keynesians now. Um, there were three really pivotal books written in the 1940s which talk about this idea of the purpose of the market, which we've kind of lost sight of. So when we're talking about rebuilding the architecture, we really need to look back at what conceptual underpinnings could be. And for that, we need to basically understand economic history. And so in many ways, we need to basically go back to these three uh, critical books. Now, what's really interesting, it's probably small print, you can't see it, you know, but you know, Pagani's The Great Transformation talks about uh, you know, the need to embed the market within society. Joseph Stiglitz wrote the introduction to that one, so you know basically where that's going to. And then Pirol Hayek at the end, The Road to Serfdom, and you have Milton Friedman. So it kind of like gives you an indication of how these books have been used uh, and perhaps abused, uh, as we come on to and as we'll see. And Schumpeter, of course, uh, whose classic line was that the essential fact of capitalism was creative destruction, that it destroys uh, that it progresses through creative destruction. Uh, and of course, this was inverted uh, in many ways by the management consultants in the 1990s. And I suppose the misuse of securitization is the literal inversion of creative destruction. It was an example of destructive creation. So uh, uh, it was kind of curious. But, you know, so Schumpeter's critical line, I think, you know, is worth basically looking at it, you know, that you know, the essential, the perennial gale of change is one of creative destruction. Yet at the same time, Schumpeter recognized that no social system can work in which everyone is supposed to be guided by nothing except his short-term utilitarian ends. Right? So there's a recognition here that basically economic man, rational uh, economic thinking, perfect, efficient markets, is basically insufficient, right? So that's at the heart of Schumpeter's argument. And what he says, which I think is really quite interesting, is that the stock market is a poor substitute for the holy grail, right? And if you think of basically how things moved throughout the 1990s, not only on Wall Street, but here in Dublin, 
uh, and the obsession with conspicuous consumption, uh, then basically you are seeing basically what the impact of that is on wider social norms and then how that can then be justified by particular epistemic groups as you go up the system, right? So, Pagliani, of course, is very interesting in terms of what he recognises is the need that there is, a, there is a need for a self-regulating market. It demands nothing less than the institutional separation of society into an economic and political sphere. So the markets are economic and rational, and basically let the market decide, because basically if you have political interference in the marketplace, that creates skewed incentives, but it also justifies what the market wants or what particular players in the marketplace want. So we recognize that there's a risk here. And Hayek, who is always regarded as the person who believes in the freedom of the market, parties in the market should be free to sell and buy at any price in which they can find a partner to the transaction. Classic free market thinking. Of course, Hayek also recognized that government has a role to play. And in no circumstances, no system could be rationally defended where the state just did nothing. Right? So we're trying to unshackle Hayek here and recognize that in actual fact, what, much in the same way that Adam Smith's thinking on uh, a moral being as an accountable being uh, has been lost because of a glib reference to the invisible hand of the market, Hayek's thinking has been, in many ways, also kind of like destroyed by reference to the first quote rather than basically what Hayek was really arguing for. So it's kind of interesting. And in the middle of the, the road to serfdom, he says, we will not grow wiser before we learn that much of what we have done was foolish. Uh, and then quotes Lord Acton at the beginning of the book, which I think is really quite a great epigram. And few discoveries were more irritating than those which expose the pedigree of ideas. And then we have Alan Greenspan here uh, from the uh, uh, testimony that he gave in Congress. Now, I was at that hearing, and it was a room, uh, I suppose, where uh, I was from here to where Alan is away from Greenspan as he was giving evidence. And it was really interesting. He arrived into the room. Last time he had been there, he was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom. We regarded as the maestro, the central banker, central banker. Uh, and he moved into the room just before 10, really in command of his brief, very sprightly, 80 years old, very sprightly, worked the room, went over, spoke to the chairman, uh, spoke to the media, you know, stood admiring everybody, and he was given a give evidence. And uh, when he actually came up with this statement, the mood in the room changed. <coughs> and the mood towards him changed. And for the next two hours, he saw his record tranched, regarded as a slave to the market rather than its master, somebody who had failed in his public service responsibilities. I mean, he was ritually defenestrated in front of us. Uh, and it was really remarkable to see him age before you. Uh, it was really quite remarkable. And given the fact that it was 80, I mean, it was quite, quite a, a difficult thing to watch. Uh, but it was really quite interesting because it was, a fun, it was a very interesting moment in the entire global financial crisis that there was an admission that this was an ideologically driven agenda. So what was economically rational is something which was politically constructed. Right? So this was a key turning point in the, in, the, in the crisis, which I think we need to basically bear in mind uh, in terms of delivering some solution moving forward. So, here is where it becomes really quite problematic moving forward. Because what we really want to do is we want to map, basically, how people use accountability as a mechanism. And of course, everybody wants accountability. Accountability is a great term, you know? I mean, everybody wants disclosure, everybody wants transparency, but what does it actually mean in practice? And how do people use it, right? Um, and to what extent is it misused, or what, to what extent is it, is it ambiguous, and, as, and its very ambiguity create problems moving forward? So, of course, there's 
many variations of this, democracy, equality, class, bureaucracy, they're all key words. Uh, and accountability, integrity, responsibility, they're also key words in terms of regulatory design or redesign. So if you look at any of the proposals that are emanating at national, regional, or a global level, they're all based on the notion of this will provide greater accountability. This will provide greater integrity. But will it? Because, as I stated at the outside of this talk, despite decades of reform, we're no closer to stable markets. We're no closer to a stable structure of financial regulation. And in many ways, the global financial crisis has falsified some of our key assumptions. So we need to really revisit this. And to revisit it, we need to basically take into account basically what and how accountability is used. So let me give you just a couple of examples. It's used as both a cause of the crisis and also the cure. So it was, oh, there was a lack of accountability, and if we do have accountability, then everything will be fine. It's the absence or the failure of effective accountability that provides the focus of the discourse, right? But it's also central to many discussions about how to deal with either specific failures or as a counter to the overall conditions that caused the crisis. So you can see it as effectively on two different dimensions. So as accountability is discussed both as a mechanism designed to foster accountability and as a condition. And equally, being accountable means being subject to these mechanisms. So alternatively, it's also a manifestation of the normative condition. Now, this is where I explained earlier that this is an exercise in calculus, right? You will, as I go through this, you will get where we're, we're coming from uh, in relation to this. So effectively, you can, you can put it as a mapping exercise like this, right? So on the one level, it's a mechanism. So it's an, you view it in instrumental terms. You know, it's a failure of particular instruments. And all we have to do is reform, replace, repair the instrument, and everything is fine. But it's also basically uh, uh, as accountability as a setting, which is you know, your normative level, you know, which is the absence or the collapse of norms more as standards. And what we need to do is to reestablish, rebuild those moral communities based on effective norms and standards. And this links back to uh, the fact that it's quite interesting that this very year is the 250th anniversary of the publication of Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments. Right? It's a much more substantive book than The Wealth of Nations, from which the invisible hand metaphor comes from. And what we're really talking about here is basically if we want to change financial regulation, we really need to address this dimension. It's not that we need necessarily any more rules. It's not even a question that we need basically people to apply the rules. It is how rules, principles, norms interact in a dynamic, responsive, preemptive fashion rather than reactive fashion. So it's not a question of designing rules like generals always fighting the last battle. We need to basically be thinking moving forward. And so it is how do we utilize the interconnection between rules, principles, and norms that ultimately is how we're going to get out of this. So let me just go, I'm conscious of the time. So let's look at what the reforms that have been introduced, either by the European Union, here in Ireland, in Australia. Uh, and what we've got is two things. They're all rhetorically focused on improving the integrity of markets. But the substance are all on repairing or creating new mechanisms of control. It's our, con uh, it's our assertion that this is not going to work. That this is just going to create the illusion of reform, as Sarbanes-Oxley was effectively an illusion of reform. Which links back into work by Murray Edelman from the 1960s on the symbolic uses of politics. And, of course, you can see this with uh, change we can believe in from President Obama. Clearly, the American public aren't so sure if the results of uh, 
yesterday's elections or any gauge. Uh, but what was kind of interesting is this, this is a speech that he gave in, uh, in June when he announced the new regulatory framework for the United States. And um, he's dealing with the idea of like, you know, tra transparency so we don't deal with, uh, deal with problems of complexity, uh, with that uh, we're going to have much more effective risk management systems in terms of understanding what the risk is. We're going to deal with gaps in the rules. Uh, and uh, we're going to make the regulators more accountable. So it's a blame game, right? That's basically ultimately what President Obama is suggesting that we move forward. So here, basically, in terms of the reforms, is where we come to the really interesting part of what I think our research agenda is, which is really looking at how you can actually create these moral communities, right? Now, by a moral community, I am not talking about uh, uh, it in, uh, I suppose, in quasi-religious terms, right? I'm talking about a, a community, how a commu epistemic community, a community of lawyers, a community of auditors, a community of regulators, a community of professionals, how they actually think, how they justify their actions on an ongoing basis. Right. Um, what we see is basically, you know, well, if we, you know, effectively have a light touch regulatory approach, then well, we go for basically uh, a managerial approach. You know, we set what the agent is accountable for, but allow them to determine what they want to do. Right. So it's a light touch, principles based regime. We can also have a performative approach, which really is kind of setting what the agent is accountable for and then determining how they should pr proceed. So that's very much a rules-based approach, right? Then you can basically have a regulative uh, approach to uh, financial regulation design, where we create these externalized oversight of the actions of the agent within a defined accountable state right, by outsiders. So we're going to tell them what accountability is and basically and we're just going to enforce it. So it's like a return in many ways to a, to a command and control form of regulation. And basically none of these strategies have actually worked, irrespective of where they've been used. None of them have worked. Right? And so what we're arguing for is that you really have to go here. You've got to go to a constitutive space. You've got to create this by uh, this interacting linkage between rules, principles, and norms. And that this cannot necessarily just be imposed, right? You've got to basically get people to buy into it, live it, and believe it, and then ultimately have a mechanism for enforcing it, right? So there are three main mechanisms in which basically this can be delivered, this can be operationalized. Because you know, we're not academics sitting in ivory towers basically coming up with, oh, this is kind of an interesting concept. It's like, how is this actually going to work in practice? So we work very closely. I work very closely with the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, uh, with uh, Ernst & Young in Australia, with the Office of the Legal Services Commission, with the Financial Services Institute of Australasia, in actually designing these kinds of systems that can actually work. Because they all recognize that there is a need to demonstrate that trust is warranted, that they are behaving with integrity. But it's how do you do it? How do you actually make that work? How do you render it operationalized? Well, you can either do it through you know, the classic theory of responsive regulation, in which you have an enforcement pyramid, Errors and Braithwaite, 1992, where you have you know, self-regulation at the bottom, and then you go up to license revocation at the top. Depending on, be on people's behavior, you basically uh, uh, allow them to make their own decisions, move up into license revocation at the top. Well, clearly, as the global financial crisis has demonstrated, this benign big gun shoots blanks because a lot of these institutions are too big to fail, right? So you can't actually utilize the, the top part. So what you've really got to do is that at the bottom part, where it is self-regulation, it is self-regulation based on 
legal requirements. Well, clearly that's, enough, that's equally not enough because in many cases the global financial crisis was an example of a perfectly legal crisis. So you've got to simultaneously uh, dig deeper or raise the floor, right? And you've also got to recognize that basically your, your ultimate threat is actually a bogus threat, right? And so clearly it's not going to work. Smart regulation, which is uh, one way of doing it, is, well, let's look at our panoply of rules and principles and figure out how we can actually use a better policy mix. Well, that's fine if your conceptual underpinnings are themselves secure. But as I mentioned earlier, as Tony Delosio, who is important not simply because he's the chairman of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, but because he's the chair of the joint board of the joint forum, um, his argument is, is that we need to revisit these conceptual underpinnings. And if we don't, then basically, ultimately, we will be doing what William McDonough has suggested. We will be rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. So smart regulation itself is insufficient, right? Then there's a third, basically, way in which you can do it, which is you can enroll these actors, right? Well, clearly, uh, actors you know, will look after their own self-interest and so what you've got to demonstrate is that their own self-interest is linked into a wider interest, a wider public interest. And for you to do that, you have to articulate what that public interest actually is. And to do that, you have to define what it is the purpose of the market is. And unless you actually define that, you cannot basically create a regulatory policy which cannot then be actually enforced. And again, this is not the musing of a group of academics. This underpins basically what uh, Lord Turner has suggested earlier this year, that effectively finance got too big. Uh, so we need to find some ways of dealing with it. So everybody agrees that we are talking about a failure of ethics, a failure of integrity. And there are four different ways in which uh, you can see how this operates in practice, right? So you can look at it from uh, Emmanuel Kant, act only according to the maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should be a universal law. Well, I don't think that anybody could seriously suggest, basically, that anybody gets off uh, very well under the categorical imperative. So from a deontological perspective, uh, uh, to use the jargon, uh, effectively, we have clearly had an ethical failure of a major level within uh, the capital markets. So then you can then look at an approach which is utilitarian or consequential, which is we portion blame on the impact. Well, an action is only ethically wrong if it has a deleterious impact. Well, clearly, even by that standard, we've got a problem, right? Um, and it's essential, I think, to differentiate between the product here there was nothing wrong with securitization per se. It was the uses to which it was put to work. And it, equally, it's a deficient defense to claim ignorance of how these products were structured or how unstable the expansion of this had made the actual system, because that is indeed what we pay regulators to do. Right? <coughs> so there was a complete failure, basically, at the levels of the individual firms, as well as within the regulatory system itself, plus at the political level. So on all of those dimensions, basically, we've had a serious ethical failure. So how do we actually get out of it? And I'm going to wrap this up so we have some time for questions by basically looking at three different dimensions of how this basically works in practice. And this links to the work of Alistair McIntyre, a very famous philosopher, uh, who argues that there is a danger that if we elevate the values of the market to a central social place, we risk creating the circumstances in which the concept of the virtues might suffer at first attrition and then perhaps something near total effacement. So one could argue that basically there is a failure of virtue ethics. And in a way, he basically says that this is basically as a consequence of compartmentalization process of compartmentalization in which you limit your responsibility to basically the social mores of your own little epistemic community. And it is basically, oh, well, there could be problems somewhere else, but it's not our problem, right? We've designed the product, we've sold it, 
it's gone to somebody else, not our problem, right? Um, and this goes the whole way through the system, and ultimately this is where the real failure is. And so we have to deal with this compartmentalization, compartmentalization issue in a meaningful way if we are going to basically create a moral community. So that's ultimately what we need to do. And so I close with this. Is it possible to do this? Well, in Australia, I think we have demonstrated that it is. And we've done this in, a, in large measure because the Australian Securities Investments Commission has strategically redesigned its mission. It's clarified what its mission is. Its focus now is on outcomes, not revolutionary. This is very much the risk-based approach of regulation adopted by the FSA or conceived by the SFSA if not adopted by the FSA. It's got a really clear idea of what it wants to do. It wants to develop initiatives to help retail investors manage and protect wealth. Right? It wants to introduce new investigative techniques to reduce systemic problems, so enforcement clearly still has a role to play. It wants to reduce red tape in administration. And here is the critical thing. It wants to facilitate inward and outward investment by differentiating the Australian marketplace by demonstrable <laughs> improvements in business integrity. This is the policy goal. This is the mission statement. This is how they are going to, so rather than having like a race to the, oh, we can't be too, too, if we're too tight on these people, they'll go, they'll go somewhere else. What we're actually going to do is we're going to demonstrate and we're going to differentiate the effectiveness of the market and differentiate it because of a higher degree of business integrity. And that's fine, but what does it actually mean in practice? And in many ways, that depends on ASIC's ability to cause market participants to embrace the reform agenda, including, crucially, its conception of business integrity. And we've just recently won a major grant from the Australian Research Council to do precisely that, so after this, I go to Australia to start work to rendering that operational. So I'll, I'll leave it there so that we have time for questions, but hopefully you'll find that useful. And thank you very much for your time.